Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. Welcome to The Moth Podcast. I'm George Dawes Green, founder of The Moth. And I'm Meg Bowles, senior director at The Moth. Every week in 2022, we've been commemorating our 25th anniversary by taking a look at our history, counting down year by year. In this episode, we'll be revisiting 2001. A lot of things happened in 2001, but to me, it was the great year of experimentation. We kept playing around with the ideas of themes and how to gather storytellers. Meg, do you remember the night at the Rose Planetarium when we had stories about coming home? I do, I do. It was such an amazing night because all the storytellers brought a different perspective on the theme of coming home. We had the astronaut Rick Houck who talked about coming home from space and landing the shuttle and being nervous about it. And we had Frank McCourt who talked about uh, going back to Ireland after the success of his book, Angela's Ashes. And do you remember the soldier who came back from battle at World War II to his little town in Ohio, and everybody in the town thought he'd been killed. So when he came into town, everybody thought they were looking at a ghost. I do. I told uh, that was amazing, and he came and told the story on stage wearing his full World War II Army vet uh, Army uh, uniform. Um, but I think it's really hard to think about 2001 without remembering September 11th because it was such a huge event in our lives and especially in New York. And I remember, you know, doing a show after those events and, and how just impactful it was. And so for 2001, we've decided to play a never before aired story from Keith Young. Keith Young was a firefighter on September 11th. And he told this story on a New York main stage barely a month after what happened. The theme of the night was Carpe Diem, stories of our most vital moments. Here's Keith Young. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, September 11th actually started out as a beautiful day. It was absolutely beautiful outside. It was sunny, it was warm. It was actually my four-year-old son's first day of uh, pre-K. And uh, I remember bringing him to the bus stop, and he was very nervous, and me and my wife were looking at him, and we were kind of had like a little tear in our eye, you know? It's a little guy, and he's going off to school for the first time in a bus, and uh, my wife goes, Keith, just let him go. Yeah. <laughs> Don't pick him up anymore. He has to get on the bus. I said, all right, all right. So he kind of like got on the bus and we told him to turn around so we could take a picture of him. And he had that look like, like he was kind of scared. And I had like a little tear coming out of my eyes. I said, give me a smile, Christian. So he gave me a smile and me and my wife and my daughter and our two dogs went walking back to the house. And then we had to drop off my eight-year-old Kaylee so she could get on her bus. And uh, that's how the day started. And we were very happy and we got some really good pictures. So... I got home, it was about 10 to nine. I got a phone call from my wife's nephew. And he said, Keith, put on the, put on the TV, put on the news right now. So I, I did. I, I don't watch the news, I don't read the newspaper. I, I, I'm terrible like that, I guess it kind of depresses me. Well, I was depressed when I saw what was going on. I saw that the first tower had been hit and uh, I was just thinking to myself in my own way, like just being a fireman, I just said, how are we gonna put this out? There's so much black, thick smoke in there right now. Those people up above have no idea what's going on. They probably lost power. They're probably scared out of their wits. You know, how are we gonna get up there and help these people out? What are we gonna do? And uh, they were talking about it being a small plane, but I didn't think it was a small plane. I said, no small plane just hits it like that. It was, it was a big plane. There was a lot, a lot of thick black smoke. So as me and my wife and my mother-in-law were watching it, the second plane came in. And uh, we noticed the big explosion, and uh, it, was, it was horrible. It was absolutely unbelievable. What I thought was, all right, we've got definite, this is a terrorist attack. I go, I go 
we've got firemen out the kazoo going up inside this, both buildings right now. I said, I'm definitely going to lose some friends today. I don't know how many, but I'm going to lose somebody I know. So uh, I kept watching. I was, uh, I was sick. I was pacing. I was nervous. I was scared. Um, I almost felt like I was going to throw up. Uh, my wife was crying. My mother-in-law, was. she didn't know what to do. And uh, I kept watching. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, how are we going to get up there? How are we going to put this out? I watched the first tower come down. And uh, I told my wife, I said, we just lost 200 guys. I said, we just lost 200 guys. And uh, I, it, uh, it hurt me. You know, it really hurt me bad. And uh, my wife was crying, and I was trying to keep it together. I wasn't crying at this point. I didn't cry. Uh, I, was really, I was really nervous. And um, I said, I'm going to have to go in. And my wife said, you're not going in today. And I said, I'm going to have to. And then we watched the second tower come down. And uh, I was, I, I just didn't know what to do. So a couple of minutes later, I got a phone call from work. My lieutenant told me, Keith, the second tower came down, and we think we lost the battery tunnel. The firemen were going through, and they can't see anything. They think they lost the battery tunnel, too. So um, I said, all right, Lou, I'll be in. And uh, my wife just broke down crying. And she said, uh, don't go in. Stay here with us. I love you. I said, honey, I got to go in. This is what we do. I'm a fireman. And they need me, and he can't give up now. So I didn't say it. I wasn't crying like I am now, but I was, uh, <laughs> I was like, I got to go in. So she said, if you're going in, then we're going to get the kids, and you're going to wait till Christian gets off the bus, and then you're going to go into work. I said, okay. So uh, my son got off the bus, and he was smiling, and I grabbed him like I never grabbed him before. And I picked him up. I kissed him. And I said, we got to go get Kaylee out of school. So we went, and we got my daughter, Kaylee. And uh, she, of course, was happy to see us. Oh, we're getting, I'm getting out of school early. So <laughs> I get her, and uh, she goes, Dad, why is everybody coming to school today? Why are we leaving early? I said, Kaylee, uh, something bad happened today. Some bad people did some bad things, and I got to go to work. And she said, when are you coming home? And I said, Kaylee, I don't know. I'm going to come home when they let me come home, OK? So uh, I told her I was taking her out for ice cream. And of course, <laughs> her and Christian were all psyched. So uh, we got to the ice cream stand, and I sat them down. And I got their favorite ice creams, and uh, I got them two scoops instead of one. <laughs> and uh, I said to Kaylee and Christian, I looked them in the eyes, and I said, you two know I love you, and I got to go to work. And I don't know if I'm going to be home. So I want you to take care of each other. And uh, I said, I want you to take care of mom. Be good to your mom. Be good to your, to your grandma. And uh, I'll see you when I get there. So my daughter, Kaylee, said, there, can you come home tomorrow morning? I said, Kaylee, I, I really hope I'm going to be home tomorrow morning. And uh, so. Uh, driving into work, it was chaotic. Uh, I was trying to go west on Merrick Road and Sunrise Highway on Long Island. And uh, it was totally packed. So I went up to Southern State, and there was nobody on the road, but I had to get by a couple of police barricades. And I, there was no cars on the road. I passed a couple of cars. They had like five guys in it, probably cops, just rushing to the scene. And then I just drove on Belt Parkway, and there was nobody. And it was the strangest thing I ever saw. It was the strangest thing I ever felt, being on Belt Parkway by myself in the middle of the day. And uh, I drove. So I got to my firehouse. I'm in Ladder 156 in Brooklyn. It's in uh, the Midwood section, south of Flatbush, north of Coney Island. And I got into work. And I said, Lou, where do you need me to go? And he said, uh, you got to stay here. And I said, Lou, I want to go. Let me get in there. He said, uh, no, you got to stay here. You got to work the brush fire unit. The brush fire unit is like uh, the lowest of the low in the fire department. <laughs> if you're fighting brush fires in New York City, there is a problem. <laughs> so, 
So I watched as the night unfolded, and uh, all I could do was uh, cook because I was, I, was, uh, I was tense. I was freaking out, and cooking is the only thing that kind of soothed me a little bit. The next day comes, and uh, I was asked to go home by the chief. He said, everybody that's worked last night, you're going to be in tomorrow for 24. I want you to go home and get some sleep. Me and my buddy got in my car and drove straight to Manhattan. And uh, thank you. <laughs> The, uh, thank you, but um, it was uh, everybody. Everybody that was a fireman that day was there. Anybody that cared about the city of New York was there. Uh, we had firemen working together. We had cops working together. We had iron workers working. We had construction workers working. We had volunteers working. We had nurses, doctors, dogs, uh, people from around the country came together as one, and uh, we worked. And it, it wouldn't have mattered if, I didn't get paid for that day, but it wouldn't have mattered, they couldn't pay me enough. It, it did, the money had no meaning at this point, nothing did. If you saw the devastation of that site, of what we looked at when I got there, the dust, the covered downtown area of Manhattan, uh, the debris that was everywhere, the papers that were in fire escapes off apartment buildings two blocks away, uh, the dust in the streets on my boots, two inches thick. The dust in everybody's nose and their eyes. The, the smoke that was still coming out of the buildings. Um, it, was, it was indescribable, you know? And it, was, it felt like it was a, a two-mile area. That it could have been two miles, but it felt like it was so huge. And uh, we started working, me and my buddy. And um, we went up. We crawled up a pile, and there was things that I did there that day that I never would have ever thought of doing, never, nor do I ever want to do them again. We were cry, climbing up steel girders. We were, uh, we were just digging and moving stuff with our hands. Um, we were finding bodies, and another body, and another body. And we are putting these bodies in body bags, and uh, the only thing I could think was, I'm giving these families some closure, because that's the only thing that kept me going at that point. Um, it was it was devastating, and uh, wound up we 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 did a couple of different groups. We worked with a couple of different teams, and nobody was a chief, nobody was a a lieutenant. Everybody was one. We worked together. We didn't bicker. We didn't argue. And I believe that's the way God wants it. So uh, when I was there, I'd, I'd heard about a couple of guys that had died that I knew, or that I had heard of that I didn't know personally. Um, the first firefighter that died, his name was Danny Sir, and uh, he had actually died from a body falling on him. Another fireman, uh, Captain Timothy Stackpole. This guy was an inspiration to anybody that's on the job. He, uh, as a lieutenant, he got burned severely in a fire in 1998. He almost lost his foot. He rehabilitated himself. Uh, he could have been out in three quarters at any time. He came back to the job. He did something unheard of. He came back to the job that he loved so much. And it was his first day as a captain in Midtown. And he lost his life that day. And another fireman, a very good friend of mine, Richie Muldowney, who was actually off. He, uh, he'd just been relieved, as many firemen were that day. They were relieved of their duties. They could go home. And uh, he wouldn't have died any other way, though, Richie. He wasn't going to go in a little house fire. He went, he went with the big boys, and he was the best. But uh, I had never been so proud, but, and I had never been so scared at the same time. And seeing everybody work together actually gave me a sense of hope that I probably never had before in my life. The fact that we could just work together, and uh, all these different agencies that normally don't give a shit about each other or talk to each other, Nobody was a cop, nobody was a fireman. We were just there and we were busting our ass to do the best thing we could, you know? And uh, I give my friends hugs now, you know? I didn't always do that. I started to, uh, to pay a little more attention to my friends and appreciate my life a little more, my kids. I just want to say that uh, that day, actually being on that pile of rubble and debris and uh, despair, I actually had a, a glimpse of hope and uh, strength, and I, I did feel this feeling of life in me. 
And I know that any people, any firemen, any cops that died there wouldn't want us to give up on our lives and our dreams and our hopes and just crawl up in a ball and die. They want us to go on because uh, that's what we're here to do. We're here to be happy. And uh, they died for us. That's the way I feel. I feel like they died for us. And we got to... We got to make it good for them, and we can't forget them. And uh, thank you for letting me talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That was Keith Young. In addition to being a New York City firefighter, Keith was a father author of the cookbook Cooking with the Firehouse Chef, and a two-time winner of the Food Network show Chopped. In 2018, he passed away from a 9-11-related cancer. So Meg, I'm remembering when we were organizing that night and that it was a great challenge because we didn't want to be horrifically grim. And um, I think... That, to me, is the beautiful thing about Keith's story, that even though it's about these horrible events, Keith is talking about blisses that he had throughout that day, taking his child to school for the first time or picking his kids up from school and taking them out for ice cream or the beauty of connecting with his colleagues. And the, the grimness of course, is there. You know, we feel it. We feel the pain. And and we know that Keith and all of us are healing is going to take a long time. But I remember that it was beautiful to hear him talk about the beauty of life. And all those moments that so many people collectively had just been through. I remember right after 9-11 talking about doing a show and we were all kind of daunted by that, you know, how do we respond to this moment? And I remember you saying we should do an evening of stories with a theme of carpe diem, that we shouldn't have like a retrospective of 9-11 stories, that we should play with the theme carpe diem and come at it from different perspectives, which we did. We had a very funny story from Mark Katz about being a speechwriter for for Clinton, and, and we had Griffin Dunn. And I remember we had Reno who talked about trying to get back to her apartment, uh, trying to cross 14th Street, the demarcation, and, and Keith Young, of course. So we had a couple of 9-11 stories because we felt it was important to to say something, to address and to the elephant in the room, this thing that we had all just been through. And I remember that all of us were thinking, we don't want this theme of healing to be cram down our throats. We will heal when we heal. Um, healing will come. It might take a long, long time. It's funny. I don't even think I thought about healing. I think I just wanted to be in a room with people. You know, <laughs> it was like we, I remember going down to Nell's on 14th Street, ironically on 14th Street, that demarcation between just the the chaos of below 14th Street and and the semi normal above 14th Street, but we all went to that small, pretty small venue really um, of Nell's, and we were all crammed in there. There were so many people, and I don't even think I thought about healing. I think I just wanted to be around people. I wanted to talk to people. I wanted to hear what other people had been through, and I wanted to hear stories. And it was, ugh, I remember it making, it made such a difference. I just yeah, remember feeling so great. there never was a time, there never was a time when, when that moth magic came in more usefully. That sense of we gather as a community, we start listening to stories. If Amen. the stories are true, we are moved together, and there's just something about being in a community when you're hearing stories. And it, the community, our response, we could tell, was changing the stories on stage. And we were helping Keith to get through this story, and he was helping us. And that sort of magic 
communal experience that you have at the moth. We were um, all processing, right? Yeah. We were all processing, and it yeah. was. It was such a communal moment. I'll never forget it. Nor will I. Well, shall we leave it there? Yes. From everyone here at The Moth, have a great week. George Dawes Green is the founder of The Moth and a New York Times best-selling author. His first novel, The Caveman's Valentine, won the Edgar Award and became a motion picture starring Samuel L. Jackson. The Juror was the basis for the movie starring Demi Moore and Alec Baldwin. Ravens was chosen as one of the best books of 2009 by the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Daily Mail of London, and many other publications. The Kingdoms of Savannah, Green's latest novel, was published this July to widespread acclaim. Neil Gaiman called it the apotheosis of Southern Gothic. The New York Times says that it's layered, but like a parfait, goes down sweet, chilled, and easy. Green shows how you can love a place's stink, find it splendid even as you despise its sediment. Green grew up in Georgia and now lives in Brooklyn, New York. Meg Bowles is a senior director of The Moth and co-host of The Moth Radio Hour. Signing on as a volunteer for The Moth in 1997, she had no idea where The Moth would take her. Over the decades, she has directed mainstay shows everywhere from Anchorage to London. Although her background in television and film served to sharpen her editorial sense and eye for detail, she was recognized for her ability to spot stories in the wild and to hone in on what transforms a seemingly small story into something universal. For her part, Meg loves working with people one-on-one, -on -one, witnessing and supporting their progress. She is especially excited to see people who never imagined themselves as having a story go on to proudly claim the moniker of storyteller. This episode of The Moth Podcast was produced by Sarah Austin Jeunesse, Sarah Jane Johnson, and me, Mark Sollinger. The story in this episode was directed by Meg Bowles and Joey Zanders. The rest of The Moth's leadership team includes Catherine Burns, Sarah Haberman, Jennifer Hickson, Meg Bowles, Kate Tellers, Jennifer Birmingham, Marina Cluche, Suzanne Rust, Brandon Grant, Leanne Gully, Inga Glodowski, and Aldi Kazan. All Moth stories are true, as remembered by the storytellers. For more about our podcast, information on pitching your own story, and everything else, go to our website, themoth.org. The Moth Podcast is presented by PRX, the public radio exchange, helping make public radio more public at prx.org.